as a parallel, if you think about deaths in airplane crashes, they are becoming fewer and fewer. But as a result of them becoming fewer, and as a result of new communication technology, we hear more about them, we hear faster about them, we get color pictures and, and witnesses telling stories about exactly how they happen. So we are more horrified by this. And this creates a distortion um, where actually the world is slowly moving in the right direction, but we perceive it as getting more and more dangerous. Welcome, I am Anders Bolling and this is Mind the Shift. This is a podcast where we talk in a broad sense about a shifting world and an integrating world. And we often use very wide brush strokes. Uh, my guest today is Andreas Berg. He is an associate professor in economics at Lund University in Southern Sweden and a fellow at the Research Institute of Industrial Economics in Stockholm. His research concerns the welfare state, development, globalization, trust, corruption, and inequality. He's also known for independent-minded writings about sociological and psychological traits and changes in society. He has written several books, he blogs, and he regularly writes columns for the leading daily Dagens Nyheter. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Anders. That was a very nice introduction, I must say. <laughs> I hope it was correct. Yes, everything was correct. Impressive. Okay. Uh, well, there, are some inf there is some information about you on the internet, you know. Uh, and I happen to know a little bit about you before. So, uh, speaking about that, when I was uh, checking up, checking your CV and everything, I saw, I don't know, remember exactly where I saw it, if it was on Wikipedia or somewhere else. Mm -hmm the official site, that you have 2,886 citations. What does that really mean for someone who's not that familiar with academia? It uh, means I need to update my CV because I think I passed the 3,000 mark uh, recently. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> so, so, well, uh, that's one of the measures that academics tend to use to measure progress and uh, distribute positions uh, and admit people uh, to programs and conferences uh, and so on. So people are happy um, about comparing themselves to others. Uh, perhaps the, sometimes they exaggerate, uh, but uh, also th there's also the, the, the meritocratic side of things that you need objective measures to avoid nepotism and such. So, so that, that means basically I've been mentioned uh, about 3,000 times in other okay. papers. Peer-reviewed peer papers or, or just any papers? Or well, If that was Google Scholar, the count actually also impact in, in books and public debate as well as peer-reviewed papers. Okay, so would that number be a good number 3000 i have i mean i have no idea <laughs> i have none i uh, think well that depends on your group of comparisons and and i don't compare myself to the rock stars of economics uh but uh, i think i'm doing okay mm -hmm. i'm sure you're doing okay that's my impression anyway so now i associate you with with uh, all kinds of interesting thoughts on human behavior in all kinds of contexts also, like migration, education, journ journalism, what have you. But hey, you're an economist. Aren't economists supposed to count money all the time? No, uh, I'm glad you asked because that's one of the misperceptions about what economists do. And I actually often introduce myself as a welfare researcher. Uh, rather than an economist, uh, because when you say you're an economist, people tend to think it's about money, uh, and it's actually not. It's about resources, the stuff we need to make us happy and satisfied. That includes fresh air and clean water, but it also leisure time, uh, health, uh, the stuff we want. And among the stuff we, we want and desire, you have material well-being and purchasing power and and, and goods and services. Uh, but money is basically 
just a tool to distribute the goods and stuff and resources. It's a very practical tool. I, I, I defend it against those who say uh, we, we, uh, we shouldn't use money anymore, we should go back to barter. Uh, but they are not an intrinsic uh, goal. Uh, they are just a tool for distribution, basically. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can come back to the, 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 the interesting issue of m- money itself later in the interview. We'll see about that. But talking about economics and what, what it actually is, there is a debate uh, in this country, Sweden, around the Nobel Prize, as you know, and there is yeah. a Nobel, Nobel Prize in economics. Is, is it, I mean, is, would you consider eco- economics to be even a, a science? And is it worthy of having one of these prizes? What's your take on that? That depends on how you practice it. Most things can be scientifically practiced if you're open-minded, open-minded and, and try to avoid being caught by your own biases uh, and, and not just confirming what you already believe. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's difficult to separate entirely Uh, the task of economics from politics, for example. So your views are going to matter, not necessarily in your results, but for sure um, it has consequences for what questions you decide to devote your time to. Some find inequality more interesting, others focus more on growth, and that probably reflects their ideas about what is important in life. Mm -hmm. So I guess you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't uh, derail the thought of uh, the concept of uh, economics as a Nobel Prize before you've gotten it yourself. Once you've gotten well, it, well, you, <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can talk it down, okay? <laughs> th- that's not a major goal for me. I, I do think and believe probably that it should develop into a more general social science prize. Uh, it's, okay. it's a bit unfair to have an economics prize and not a prize for smart political scientists and sociologists. And actually recently the, the prize has been given to people who... B- span the borders across disciplines who who add psychology, sociology, political science to the field of economics. And I think that uh, development will continue and should continue. It's a good one. That's true. That's a good point. Uh, So uh, I have a question here and I have to, my first, I mean, I've had already asked you several questions, but this is the first official one. And I have to um, apologize in advance for starting off with, uh, with a ridiculously big question. But the thing is that the whole starting point uh, for this podcast is that the world is shifting and largely because humanity is in the process of becoming integrated for the first time in history. I mean, that has never happened before and people might argue that we're not integrated, but I mean, compared to how it used to be anyway. And, uh, and I think you should be one of the, the best people to respond to this kind of question. So I personally find it a little bit odd that so few debaters are acknowledging this ongoing integration, or if they do, they don't seem to give it much attention. So to me, there seems to be some kind of direction here, maybe albeit two steps forward and one step back, but still a di- kind of some kind of direction. But some people seem to think that things could still go either way, That is, uh, I mean, development could just as well start rolling backwards again towards less integration and more separation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I mean, I read an article just today in Dagens Nyheter or a column uh, that said something that is very often said today that that, uh, the development that we are seeing now is evidence that, that things are actually going backward, that trade is actually going less trade, more nationalism, uh, more borders and all that. What, what do you think? Is, is there a direction towards more integration or could things just go either way? Well, f- things have gone uh, both ways historically. Uh, you're right that the long run trend is towards uh, more trade, more travel, more information flows across borders and, and globally. Uh, However, there have always been backlashes uh, against globalization. There have been periods of protectionism, there have been periods of nationalism, uh, and I think what we're seeing now is a bit of a backlash against the very forceful and rapid increase in globalization that we had in the 80s and the 1990s. 
and and what else is is to expect actually um more recently maybe this has gotten even worse or better depending on how you look at it uh but i think we're seeing now also the rise of regions regionalization in the fact that many big manufacturing firms uh, no longer feel that it's enough to have only factories in one country say for example china um, because it's risky uh, both with respect to uh, global diseases but also with respect to trade policies and protectionism so they feel that they need to have one factory in in each region of the world uh, and that might actually also lower transportation costs and, and give them a better customer service or whatever. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. In the long run, I'm pretty sure uh, that technology will bring us towards more and more uh, integration uh, across the world. Uh, borders are political constructs, but technology knows no political limits in the long run. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I couldn't agree more, actually. I mean, I love looking at Google Earth uh, uh, yeah. when you can, there are no borders. You know what I'm talking about. When you just see see Earth from as it is, as it looks from space, and you don't see the borders, and you, you actually see what's that's chunks of land and chunks of sea and, and people living there. <laughs> so yes. it's a construct, as you say. Okay, good. Uh, and now... This has something to do with what you just talked about, I guess. Uh, but um, anyway, there, you've written a bit about the so-called negativity bias, mm. as have I, uh, to explain to the audience what this is. Uh, it's basically uh, our propensity to look for uh, bad things, uh, misery, as opposed to, to concentrate on the, all the good things that are happening, happening all the time. We tend to forget those and... and um, uh, look for and uh, detect danger in every corner of life. Uh, uh, and this yeah. is, uh, uh, this, this, sorry, yeah. I, I don't think we necessarily look for the bad thing, uh, things. We, we just give it more focus. And, and that, that is and has been completely rational. You, you should be rapidly aware of threats. Uh, against uh, your your yourself or your family or your society, uh, so um, this has of course consequences uh, for how we perceive the world when we now get information from from all countries very rapidly, uh, which we never have before in our uh, in the history of human development. Yeah, so it's something uh, basically something good. You mean that, but but it's it's become. A bit of a problem in a world where there are less risks around. Well, our our, our gut reactions were were shaped uh, when the world was uh, far from globalized. When when we knew about thirty or fifty people in our group of hunters and gatherers, and and then we spread across the world. Uh, but we lived like that for a long time, and and the most recent information revolution is only uh, a few decades old. So of mm -hmm. of course we are still learning how to cope with this massive information flow that, that we now are facing every day. Okay, and the, the, the so-called lizard brain is tricking us a little bit here, maybe. Yes. Okay, so, but lately, actually, some, quite a few writers and debaters have, have talked and written about this thing and, and, and also pointed out that we have a negativity bias and maybe that's not all, uh, all good. For us, I mean, you is you are one example, and then you have uh, people like Rosling, Pinker, Ridley, Norberg, Roser, yes. and, and myself, yourself. and exactly. <laughs> yes, to some extent, and and there is even something today called constructive journalism, which I think think is is a brilliant concept, and uh, we never saw that before. So mm -hmm. it, maybe something is happening here. Do you think that we are finally freeing ourselves from from the chains of the the old lizard brain here? Uh, well, I don't think we are freeing ourselves, but we are learning how to handle it better. Uh, and I think that, that that's the answer you should give if you're a rational optimist in, in the sense of Matt Ridley, for example. Uh, of course, becoming aware of our biases and learning about our gut reactions should mean in the long run that we react better and that journalism and public debate and politics should uh, improve. 
Uh, however, um, I think you managed to more or less mention everyone who has written about the world becoming better. Uh, and if you compare that category of books to the category of books that write about um, uh, decline, problems, threats, uh, various tendencies that are destroying our society or threatening the future of our children, those books are numerous. They outnumber the optimists or the rationalists by, by mm -hmm. a factor of 10 or 100. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I, I think this will be a very, very slow development. I see actually a tendency uh, among people to say these days, sure, things have become better, acknowledging the impact I think in particular Hans Rosling has, has had. Mm -hmm. But then there's a but. And this but may be, but that was at the expense of global warming, or but uh, in these areas, things have not gotten better, and Hans Rusling didn't mention this or that, and so on. And I think if, if that's the only effect, then the optimists or the rationalists have not had a great impact. Uh, what we should do is to say, sure, we've had a lot of progress, uh, but many problems are becoming acute and to tackle them we must learn not only from our mistakes but also from our progress. What did we do correct in the past when we solved uh, the problems of the past? And with reasoning like that we make good use of our lizard brain as, as you put it. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean uh, actually focusing on what did we do right. I, I know that Steven Pinker has, has pointed that out and talked about that. It's yeah. a question we ask ourselves too seldom, I think. Yeah, I, I sometimes right? say that the, the big question is no longer whether the world is getting better or worse. We have good data on that. We know in what aspects there have been improvements and we know in what aspects there have not. And we also know about the things that move in the wrong direction. The, the, the $10,000 question right now is why did the world improve in the areas where it did and what can we learn from that? Yeah. That's a really, really good question to ask yourself. Uh, and in this um, context, you, you, you wrote this book, Two Filters, where yeah. basically the first filter is what we've been talking about right now, isn't it? Uh, yes, more or less negativity, negativity bias. Device. Yeah, and then the second filter is, is this uh, propensity we have to, to cluster in, in uh, groups of people that are like-minded, that think like ourselves, that have the same use. You might call it... Uh, opinion bubbles perhaps and it has yeah. been uh, exacerbated by social media and all that when we when we cluster like that um so uh and effectively it's, it's often said then that polarization has become worse with new information technology because of this because of social media is that true or is it just that that information technology has has pointed this, this out more clearly to us and that we have forgotten how the old world actually was like? Well, uh, I think that is precisely the right question to ask. It's a question that I encourage more people, especially young scholars, to work with, with all the new and fancy tools you have. You could do big data text analysis of books or news coverage before uh, and, and now to see whether we are romanticizing about the past or whether things were equally bad or perhaps even worse. Uh, to get at some answer, I think we first need to, to distinguish polarization getting worse from polarization becoming more visible. Be because what information and communication technology does is that we see more conversations, we see more debates, we see more events. Um, as a parallel, if you think about deaths in airplane crashes, they are becoming fewer and fewer. But as a result of them becoming fewer, and as a result of new communication technology, we hear more about them, we hear faster about them, we get color pictures and, and witnesses telling stories about exactly how they happen. So we are more horrified by this. And this creates a distortion uh, where actually the world is slowly moving in the right direction, but we perceive it as getting more and more dangerous. Um, so I guess, in a way, polarization getting more visible is the same as more polarization because we, we are now focusing on, on different areas. Um, but there are a few studies that compare the situation today with 
um, the old media, so newspapers and books. And, and, mm-hmm. and, and one of them found it actually that, yes, when you read news online, you tend to read the stuff that people that are like-minded or have, share the, your political ideology also tend to read. Um, but, but that's true also for national newspapers. And, and when you hang out with your friends, your family and your workmates, they are even more uh, similar to you compared to the people you meet online. Uh, so yes, there are filter bubbles or echo chambers or whatever you want to call them, uh, but they didn't really appear with the internet. They, they are among your friends, your colleagues, uh, and even in your family. Yeah, that's really interesting. I personally have the uh, uh, experience that I, or I, I, I think that I <laughs> have the experience of actually meeting or running into uh, opinions uh, very different from my own uh, surfing on the internet, being on the yes. internet more than I did before. Because I mean, how how would I how would I do that in the eighties, for instance? I mean, uh, that would entail talking to strangers on on trains or i don't know how how, how did even how, how did people even get in touch with the, the other side of things no i think that's a valid point and there's a another psychological bias is that when you remember the 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 summers when you were young you tend to remember the the, the days when the sun was shining and you went swimming <laughs> yes. and everything was nice and you forget about the boring and and the tragic things that happen and i think there's a risk that we're doing the same with political debate or public debate it's also i believe worth noting that polarization may not necessarily be a bad thing. I mean, now we are discussing filter bubbles and the polarized society, but only a few decades back, I think both you and I are old enough to remember this quite quite clearly, uh, many people were worried about politics becoming boring. Uh, the major candidates in the states, the Democrats and the Republicans, and, and in Sweden, and the Labour Party and, and the right-wing party, uh, they became similar and and political scientists were worried that maybe uh, democracy were was losing its nerve that people were not engaged that we stagnated around some kind of welfare state based on a capitalist economy and that was that and that was actually only 20 years ago Uh, so it's worth reminding yourself of the positive aspects of polarization when we actually wanted political debate to become more intense uh, but of course, now we only see the negative side of it. That's, that illustrates the negativity bias once again. Yes, it does. Yeah, it's really fascinating what you're, te- what you're saying here because I, I absolutely remember that, that period and it was, as you say, not very long ago. And related to that, we also uh, today... Uh, oh, that was some kind of s- sound there. I don't know what it was. Anyway, uh, we're talking a lot about... Uh, or debaters are talking about... Um, the rise of uh, conservatism and nationalism. Mm. And many people are very concerned about that, uh, worried about that. And maybe that's a little bit of the same thing here, uh, because it may be that these, these, uh, these uh, traits, these feelings, these opinions were always there, but for a long time, for some decades now, the so-called uh, left-leaning uh, uh, liberals have had the, the have been the ones who have um, formulated the problems in society and have been the, the so-called elite and that these other people with with these feelings these national or nationalistic feelings and conservative opinions they haven't really had a say and now with the help of the internet of course and with with the help of them b- being able to see that they're they are many Maybe they have become strengthened, and they can. F- they they are finally voicing their opinions, which they didn't do before, but they had them before. And yeah. so there's also some kind of misconception that this is something new when it's really something old. But all of a sudden we see it. But the liberals are shocked because they didn't even realize that these people existed. Would Would you describe it uh, that way as well? That this is what has happened. Uh, to some extent, uh, I think you should do research on many things, but you could also do research on this liberal intellectual elite because uh, I was actually shocked by the surprise among many uh, in these <laughs> groups when the Sweden Democrats, for example, entered the Swedish parliament. They acted as if these opinions had never existed and suddenly mm-hmm. they, they were in the parliament. Whereas if you are only slightly more aware of... Uh, 
the whole span of society, uh, you, at least I was thinking that, well, these opinions are clearly there. Uh, the parties don't uh, run in the election or their candidates are complete lunatics so people don't vote for them but when they get their act together become more organized there's a big potential for right-wing populist uh, slightly xenophobic parties that didn't come as a shock to me um, i think many in in the liberal elite uh, has had slightly naive or exaggerated expectations on the effect of political participation on people's views and opinions and, and values. Mm -hmm. um, back in the 90s, when politics was boring, there was also a hope that if people participated more politically, they would learn to see the world from opponents' points of view. They would learn about the difficulties uh, of political and collective decision making, so they would become more sophisticated citizens or more sophisticated consumers of politics by engaging in civil society. And, and many refer to uh, political scientist Bob Putnam and his studies of civil society in it Italy. As it turned out, it was more sophisticated citizens that were more prone to join uh, organizations and uh, associations and groups, but uh, the civil society did not have a causal effect on people's views or civicness. And I think we experienced something similar when the internet revolution came. If you look back at the books published among tech enthusiasts around the year 2000, yeah. you could see social media discussion groups, web forums on the rise. And there was a lot of hope for this uh, tremendous democratic um, impact that that internet would have by uh, enabling people to discuss politics uh, across the world uh, and, and engage. Which they did, but not in the, in the way that the liberal elite expected. <laughs> My point exactly. I think if you read those books, you will, you will see that all of that more or less happened. There was um, uh, this, the revolution in, in Egypt and other countries that was clearly aided by the new communication technology. And, and there are uh, lots of political initiatives that are making use of, of everything from Twitter to blogs to Instagram. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when we expected this or talked about it in the future, we sort of missed the fact that many will, of course, use it uh, for purposes uh, that are not really aligned with the goals of, of the liberal elite. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, I can share with you an anecdote that I've, I've had for a long time, but I, I never really oh, yeah, shoot. Fi figured out what to do with it. So I, I attended a workshop with political scientists discussing um, what they referred to as the rise of right-wing populism and the crisis of democracy. Mm -hmm. And they kept mentioning this together, uh, and I was probably the only economist in the room. And, and at, eventually I, I dared to ask a question uh, why these two phenomena, the rise of right-wing populism and the crisis of democracy, was lumped, were lumped together. Because the way I see what has happened is that the rise of right-wing populism is uh, a trend that happened when voters were unhappy with the established parties started new parties, voted for them, and in many countries actually came to power. So it's a sign that democracy is working exactly as intended. Political scientists should be happy. But of course they were not, uh, because these new, newly started parties tended to be populist and uh, in many cases xenophobic. And that, I mean, I too share the views. I'm not entirely happy about this development, but you need to separate the content of uh, political engagement from the form. And, and I think we have to confess that democracy is working and that's why we are seeing a rise of populist right-wing parties. 
Uh, a sociologist told me that to understand what is happening, you should not think of it as a wave of xenophobia or a wave of populism that is sweeping over Western democracies. You, you should think of it as a reservoir. It has been all, there all the time and politicians are becoming more skilled at tapping this reservoir for votes that give mm -hmm. them uh, power. That's what's happening. The internet opens the hatch uh, completely. <laughs> internet uh, helps to open um, the hatch. Or whatever it's called. I don't know if it's the hatch yeah. or... <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. I, I, I absolutely think you're right there. These uh, people that we are talking about, and, and I, I can also add that when I've looked into this, I, I have seen and read about it that uh, the trends, the underlying trends, don't don't show this wave as you were also referring to. So that's an, that's evidence that there is no such wave because if you look at the underlying trend, trends over decades, yep. xenophobia and tolerance for other people, people with with color and all that, steadily, steadily, slowly but steadily going in in a so-called liberal direction. So there there is not no big change there. That is entirely correct, and I wish more people knew about this and understood that there is no tension between these two facts, that parties are gaining more votes because more people are voting um, along this dimension. At the same time, the potential for these parties uh, is, is, is decreasing because tolerance, the long run, yeah. Uh, is increasing and xenophobia in the long run is not rising and in many cases actually decreasing. So what I believed happened was that uh, the established parties managed to keep other political issues salient in the political debate. Uh, and those were the same issues that had been salient for 100, 150 years. It's yeah, capitalism yeah. versus socialism uh, or the welfare state versus the market economy. But, but that's the main dimension along uh, which political debate took place. Uh, then, aided by, of course, uh, first the Balkan War and then the crisis in Syria, immigration issues became more salient. And when they become more salient people start voting according to their beliefs uh, in this dimension, and then new parties arise because democratic systems are actually working. I think that's basically what has happened uh, in Western democracies. Yeah. Now, these, uh, these parties, these um, movements, uh, the nationalist, uh, nationalistic movements, the, the conservative, as we tend to call them, they are often scared of, uh, in, in their turn, scared of what they call, or what we all call globalization. And yeah. I was a bit, I was uh, on another podcast the other day, actually, as a guest, and my, the host was a little bit confused that I, I uh, labeled myself as a globalist, because uh, to him, that had bad connotations. So I had to explain a little bit what I meant by uh, globalization. Um, uh, is it, is it, would you say that globalization is entirely a good thing and how do you even, even define it? How is, what's your definition? Uh, so um, globalization is basically, simply put, integration um, between countries and people. Um, and that applies to um, persons, goods, services, uh, but also uh, data, uh, information flows, and, and, and knowledge. Uh, that's what's happening. And, and some see this as a very problematic trend. Uh, some are very happy about it. Uh, I see it as a technology-driven trend and therefore something that you, um, you can have different views, but the possibility is to roll globalization back or prevent people from communicating across borders. I don't see that happening, even if you strongly dislike it and try hard to stop it. Uh, so even if you dislike this, I think you're better off um, steering it uh, or, or uh, thinking about political responses rather than trying to stop or reverse it. Even in the, the most yeah. 
closed countries, people find ways to communicate with the outside world. Hmm. So w- w- where do you think these uh, bad connotations come from? I think they come from the lizard brain, of course, uh, because <laughs> what we're seeing is is basically something new, something unknown, which is easy to use uh, as a scapegoat uh, when bad stuff happen. So uh, just like we saw people uh, getting angry about machines uh, because they stole the jobs from workers, uh, you now get angry uh, when people in other parts of the world are taking jobs from workers in Europe or the United States. Uh, But of course, uh, in the long run, it's actually good that machines or other people do some of our jobs because then we can do other things and we can enjoy both the stuff that the machines and the Chinese or the Bangladesh are producing and the stuff that we produce. Uh, So technology and globalization are are fundamental reasons for for our prosperity. Uh, But you should never expect... uh, the broad people to to be very thankful uh, but rather to 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 keep seeing problems uh, based on on what is happening in the short run it's interesting that you mentioned the lizard brain because lizard brain here because as when i come to think of it it's there's an interesting fudge here uh, in the fear of globalization between actually between the neo-nationalists or whatever we should call them, and the left wing. You remember mm-hmm. the anti-globalist globalization oh, yes. movement in yes. the early yes. 2000s? I mean, yep. they were mainly left wing people and they were anti, anti-globalization. And now we have the right wing people <laughs> saying the same thing. This is kind of interesting. Are they both, sure. is it just a lizard brain or is, is it, does it kind of... Uh, come together in at some point between left and right here or what is right even oh um i think and this is out of my expertise as an economist but i i find the idea fascinating that a new generation will always find something to protest against uh, connected to the society that their parents have created and and We've seen those movements more or less all the time in in the 60s uh, and and the protests against the war in Vietnam and um, very extreme left-wing politics. And then you have the anti-globalization movement uh, and then you have the global warming movement and now you also have a right-wing protest against globalization. And I think... Part of this is explained by basic human needs to find like-minded uh, and to gather together uh, and share values and experiences. And nothing helps that better than having uh, an external common enemy on which you can portray all sorts of bad things. And, and I think globalization fills that purpose, both for right-wing nationalists and for, for left-wing anti-globalists, or has historically done so, at least. Yeah, okay. Um, another thing that one often hears uh, these days, or have been hearing for a long time, actually, is that talking about left and right, I, I have more and more problems with that definition actually left and right i i find i have a hard time knowing what what is what but anyway um people on the left they are stating for a fact that people on the right which is in the american context liberals i guess uh they promote and believe in something called the trickle down effect i mean if you let a few lucky people get as rich as they want, some of their wealth will trickle down to the not so lucky majority. Now, yeah. is that even a thing, the trickle down effect? And if it, if it is, is it true that, that free market liberals like it? Um, good example, actually. I, I, I use that myself to illustrate how weird the debate has become. We, we do not listen to the other side. We listen to our own side when they describe what the other side is thinking. Oh, uh, so, straw man, straw man argument. It, it, 
it's a great example of a straw man argument. And the first time I heard about the trickle down effect, I had no idea what they meant. And, and I heard about it from left wing uh, politicians telling people what they were thinking on the right uh, part <laughs> of the spectrum. But most of my friends were at the right part of the spectrum at that time, and I had never heard them make a similar argument, uh, even remotely similar to the trickle-down effect. Uh, and I think it, the origin is actually, or, or what they are trying to describe, um, is what people who believe in the market economy or, or would, would describe as a climbing up effect. Uh, they would describe it as social mobility. Uh, so people on, on, on the right that are market friendly would say, well, maybe income inequality is not that bad, provided that people who are poor today uh, have the opportunity to become richer tomorrow if there is social mobility upwards in the income distribution. Uh, but it's not about wealth or uh, money trickling down from the rich. It's about give, giving the poor uh, the means to climb up the social ladder and the economic mm. ladder. Okay, good that you got that sorted out then. Um, and you mentioned inequality, of course, which is uh, at the core here uh, in this issue. Is equality, inequality getting worse or not? Because you hear also a lot of discussion going on about that thing um, uh, in the debate about globalization and where the world is going and everything. Is, there, was a, there was this famous French economist, Th Th Thomas Piketty. Is his yes. first name Thomas? Yeah, Thomas Piketty. He wrote this famous book about inequality and, and it showed, uh, according to him then, that it was, it was actually... Uh, as a matter of fact, getting getting worse. Uh, so what's your take on this? Was he correct there or was he wrong or, or is it both ways? <laughs> well, when it comes to the facts, he was basically right, but he was talking about inequality of wealth and income within countries. Okay. And when you ask about inequality in the world in general, you also need to add that inequality between countries uh, has actually been falling for several decades. Uh, the world is no longer bipolar with a few rich and, and a lot of very poor. Now uh, the world has a big middle class uh, with a few countries that are much poorer and a few countries that are much richer. But, but the income distribution has uh, one single peak uh, in the world, uh, just like it has within each country. Um, now... Piketty was also right that the reason for increasing income inequality in Western rich countries uh, is basically capital income. So capital gains and capital rents. And they tend to accrue more at the top. So you speak about the top percent or even uh, the 0 0.1 top percent. However, uh, Piketty also had this theoretical model that predicted that under some assumption, uh, capital income would concentrate to fewer and fewer that would get richer and richer. And that particular theoretical model, I think, became much more popular and well-known than it deserved to be. Mm -hmm. Sounds a little bit like uh, Karl Marx there, doesn't it? A little bit, yes. Inevitability uh, of, of, of uh, the, uh, the concentration of capital. Yeah, I think Piketty will, will be happy with, with that reflection. <laughs> okay. So, uh, now but, you... But, but when we yeah. discuss in, inequality, I think it's also important to, to note that the Piketty's uh, book triggered discussion about the extent to which these capital gains... Uh, which sound like rich people um, owning the means of production, but in many countries, it's basically housing, it's real estate. And the reason why they are increasing is that house prices uh, and real estate prices are increasing. Mm -hmm. in yeah, look at countries. Stockholm, I mean. Exactly. So, so you, you, you time your first apartment or first house correctly, and then when you sell it, you make a big profit. And that year, you are registered as a high-income earner. But the next year, you, you move 
down again in the income mm. distribution. But the next year, someone else sells their house and mm. now uh, the market has gone up even more. And you and never I actually think, have the money in your hand. Well, you have, uh, if you cash out and, and move away from Stockholm or <laughs> when you retire and move to something smaller, uh, that's, that's, that's when you get to spend it. Uh, and and this, this actually partly signals that problem is actually not that big. But I would also say that it is a big problem if the biggest decision regarding your economic standard is the timing of your real estate uh, transactions. It's, it's really odd. This will matter more than uh, your education decisions or your work decisions or uh, if you come up with good, good ideas or, or even start firms. If you start a good firm, you, you can get rich once you sell it to another firm. Uh, but as long as you work there, uh, you're not necessarily uh, a rich person. And I think... This says something potentially problematic about uh, the reasons for inequality. Um, it's really hard to get rich by, by working uh, and educating yourself compared to timing your real estate transactions well. Okay. But then there, is, there are a few entrepreneurs as well who, who, who make it, but there are not very many. No. <laughs> they are impressive and, and they are fascinating, but they are not representative. So I think the short answer to whether we should worry about inequality or not is, is that you should look at the procedure. And if you're happy with the procedure that explains why some people are very rich, then it's not a problem. If you have problems with the procedure, you should try to uh, change the procedure so, so that people are satisfied with why some are rich and, and feel that they are justifiably rich. Okay. And uh, to, to uh, counter the, the inequality in society, there has uh, social engineers over the years have, have um, developed what is called the, the welfare state, I guess yep. you could say. And that's also one of your research areas. So um, how is the welfare state doing these days? Is it, is it uh, alive and oh, kicking? Oh, it's fine. <laughs> everywhere or in some countries only no it's spreading um it's correct this is my main research area i devoted almost 20 years to understanding how how to do the trade-off between the capitalist economy with decent social protection arrangement and once i figured that out fairly well people stopped caring about it and we instead started having political debates regarding populism and nationalism and, and cultural issues uh, but i think uh, apart from that the welfare state is actually doing much better uh, than the reputation and much better than many doomsday predictions, uh, both from the right, uh, where they said the, the welfare state will make us lazy, it will destroy the economy, it will be too expensive. Uh, and there were people on the left saying that oh, neoliberalism is now uh, forcing, or even globalization is now forcing politicians to cut back on the welfare state. I think these two doomsday scenarios uh, have been avoided in most countries. The welfare state has been adjusted, but it's doing fairly well. And I think actually one of the major conclusions that people will draw from the corona crisis that we are in the middle of right now mm -hmm. is that the welfare state is actually a, a very good in invention uh, because the country, um, let's take you United States, for example, if you have very minimalistic social security arrangement, people will ignore signs that they are ill and go to work uh, anyway. And they might even refuse uh, testing because uh, if they test positive for the virus, uh, they will not be able to work and then they will not be able to support themselves. And, and if you have sufficient welfare state arrangements, people can afford to stay away from work uh, when they suspect they are ill. And I think that's uh, a big problem in the United States right now. And in the long run, that experience will probably strengthen the welfare state. Okay, do you think it even might have an impact in the election this year? Since it's so, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's happening oh. now. Oh, you don't think so? it, it, it might. Uh, predicting U.S. politics is too <laughs> difficult for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
the welfare state, is it a left wing thing or is it a nationalist thing? Uh, it's both. And it's, it's a liberal both. thing. And it's a liberal thing too. Okay. Yeah. It's all, it's everything. Yes. Uh, I mean, if you look historically uh, and judge politicians by their actions rather than their rhetoric, uh, what I just said is, is true. Uh, okay. Then you, you will see in most countries, uh, the socialists and the market friends, they are debating and discussing and portraying themselves as, as bad persons. Uh, but they have actually, in most Western countries, uh, taken turns in uh, constructing and expanding the welfare state okay so and then they they have also taken turns in um changing it uh, and, and making some adjustments and cutbacks to prevent the welfare state from overshooting and making it more sustainable in a global economy uh, and I think uh, Sweden is, is one example of that, which, which I have written about in, in my book called The Capitalist Welfare State, which sort of summarizes this fact that the welfare state is, is when it's working uh, as, at its best, it's combined with a competitive, well-functioning capitalist economy. Uh, you need a good business climate and property rights to finance the taxes that, that make up uh, the welfare state. Okay, Andreas, this has been a fantastic conversation. To wrap things up, I, I was thinking of maybe going back to the, the, the basic issue of money here. We were uh, talking a little bit about money in general. Uh, yes, very little, but then we managed to avoid, the, <laughs> avoid it completely. <laughs> we we did it. Yeah, but I'm, I'm hitting back now. Uh, so okay. j final question, which is a philosophical one, I guess, but, but nevertheless, uh, I think uh, a viable uh, question. Uh, and it's an honest question from my side. Um, now that we see money being less and less physical, I mean, we are going over more and more to, to electronic uh, money. And it's, it's uh, basically in my life, money is, is just, uh, I mean, um, a binary system of, of numbers on a display, uh, whether it be it, uh, I send money to some friends or, or I take out money from my, my bank account or I move money from different accounts or I, I pay for something I buy on, over the internet. I, nev I never see money physically. So that gives the impression that it's, may maybe this is uh, a first little hint that um, th this rapid shift away from physical money is some kind of embryonic step, you might say, away from money as a means of valuing stuff in general. And this is, of course, a very, very long trend. But you, you said in the beginning, I think, that that's, it's not a good idea to go back to barter. But, but could there be something, I mean, could it be shifting in a way so that money would be something different than what we conceive it as today in, say, 50 years or whatever? Well, in 50 years, um, we will not see it, but it will still be there. Um, and, and that's not a new thing, actually. We, we started our economies without money, as we know it now. Uh, we used sacks of grain or, or even cattle or stones or whatever um, to facilitate barter. And then we invented basically paper money, which were basically, first they were notes saying, I owe you three sacks of grain. And you just put the grain somewhere where you trusted them to remain. And then you started uh, making business using these sheets of papers instead. Uh, and then you invented coins because you wanted to attach some value to, to the money to prevent people from just counterfeiting uh, false money. Uh, then you got rid of this valuable money because it was useful for, for central banks to be able to print more money uh, when they, um, well, initially because they wanted to finance war that they couldn't finance otherwise. Uh, then we found out that plastic was more convenient than paper and coin and we started using plastic cards instead. And now we think plastic uh, cards are a nuisance. You don't want that. You just <laughs> want to use your, your cell phone instead and get rid of the plastics. Uh, so now money is, is changing shape again. But it's still there as, as a measure and a store of value and an account uh, that we use uh, whenever we barter and... and, and deal with other people and, and it will always be but maybe it will affect the 
the speed of inflation and things like that, that, that uh, the worth, uh, the value of money will change quicker when we don't have physical? I, I don't know. I'm just guessing here. Yeah, I'm guessing not. So the, the inflation is basically just uh, an average of the prices uh, that we have, and the prices are determined by supply and demand. Uh, yeah. So it's pretty independent of the fabric of which money are manufactured. Hmm. Okay, Andreas Berry, uh, it's been fascinating. Uh, great having you as a guest, and uh, thank you very much for... Thank you. It was fun. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks.